Welcome to MCB 170, Society in the Brain. This is Lecture 1, pre-recorded Lecture 1. Lecture 1 covers Part 1 of Module 1. And in Module 1, we'll talk about how the brain is wired for society. What that, what that means is that um, the brain actually does have specialized regions and specialized functions for communication between brains and also for social interactions. And we will talk about that in module one. In uh, part two of module one, which, be, which will be covered in lecture two, the next lecture, lecture two, we'll talk about specific brain regions, brain re regions that are specialized for communication and for specific aspects of social interaction. In this lecture, lecture one, which is part one, we'll talk about this idea in, in general ways um, about the very, very close association between the individual psyche, the individual mind and brain, and the social world. And we'll talk about uh, the structure of the brain on multiple levels. So before we get started with lecture one, I'd like to ask you a question. What for you is the real world? Is it nature? Is the real world for you nature? trees and mountains and sky and ponds? Or is it the internet? Is it social media? If you were confined to prison, the real world for you would be mostly the other prisoners. If you're in prison, you don't have any freedom. Uh, you can't escape to nature and you probably have limited computer access. So for you, the real world is going to be the social world, largely. It's going to be other inmates. Um, we will actually discuss this particular image later on in the course when we, will, when we will discuss the role of testosterone, the hormone testosterone. And we'll ask the question, what does testosterone do? And it was thought at one time that testosterone makes us aggressive. So if I asked you, which of these men has, do you think has the highest testosterone level? You might point to this guy because he looks kind of aggressive. Later research showed that the real role of testosterone is to help an individual establish and maintain high social status. So the man in this group who has the highest testosterone level is probably the one with the highest status. He'd be the leader of this group of inmates, which I think is probably this guy right here because he is most directly addressing, confronting the camera person, the outsider to the group. Lots of the other guys aren't looking at the camera person directly, right? They're, some of them are even looking to him. We'll discuss that later on in the, in the, in the class, in a later lecture, in a later module. Um, but for now, I just wanna point out that the social world, if you're a prisoner, is a big part of your world. But even for the rest of us who are fortunate enough not to be in prison, we can choose to go out into nature. We can choose to, to um, get onto the internet. Uh, but even for us, I would say that the social world, the world of other people is a huge part of our world. Um, that it occupies our thoughts and it, and it shapes us and, and determines who we are to a very, very large extent. How do we know about that? How do how do we how do we know about how do we know that, that the social world is so important um, to our psyche, the normal operation of our psyche? Well, take for example daydreaming. It used to be thought that people who daydream had some sort of problem, that they were sad and lonely and depressed, and that daydreaming was bad. It turns out that pretty much everybody daydreams. Um, we are often, all of us are often absent from our current situation. We are, our mind often wanders away from the task at hand. And when our mind wanders, where does it wander to? Does it wander to nature? Does it wander to science? Um, maybe for some of us it does. You know, but for most of us, when our minds wander, we think about other people. And that's, it happens with everybody and it's quite normal. And it isn't necessarily a bad thing. A recent study by Marr and coworkers revealed that people most often daydream about other people. And this isn't necessarily bad. 
they found that daydreaming about close friends and family was associated with emotional well-being. That people who, when their minds wander, think about those who they know, who they, with whom they have relationships, and who they, could, who they probably will end up seeing later on, um, were psychologically and socially well-adjusted. On the other hand, daydreaming about people with whom closeness is unlikely or precluded was associated with feelings of loneliness and lack of social support. So people who daydream about those who are not accessible to them socially, who are out of their league, are the ones who may have um, psychological and social disabilities. More generally, these findings show that even just thinking about other people can affect how we feel. So the social world affects us profoundly. We, it, it, it can determine how we feel. It can determine our mood. It can determine our happiness. It has shaped us in profound ways. And we'll talk about those as we go along in the course. And the idea that the social world shapes us is not new. It's been around for quite a long time. Um, and that idea came under the heading of intersubjectivity. And I'll define intersubjectivity in the next slide, but it's basically the idea that we experience the world, human beings experience the world together, that we determine how, e how each other experiences the world, that essentially we shape each other's minds, we shape each other's psyches, that, that the normal human psyche um, is, is a product of its interactions in society. And this idea was developed back in the, starting in the 1800s with certain continental philosophers. And they were called continental philosophers because they came from continental Europe. And the leaders were these gentlemen, Edmund Husserl, Martin Heidegger, and Jean Paul Sartre. And this is kind of a temporal progression. So the first one to, to introduce this idea was Husserl. His ideas were refined by later philosophers. And so what did they say? Well, first of all, what is intersubjectivity? Intersubjectivity is the condition in which experience is shared between people. So inter is between, and subjectivity is experience. It's how you feel about things, not how they are maybe in a subjective sense, but how you feel about them. So how we feel about things, how I as an individual feel about things, has been determined largely by my past interactions with other people. They kind of taught me how to feel about it. Parents teach their children, show their children how to interpret their experiences. That's why, fa that's why um, family interactions are so important. You know, the most important part of society for you probably uh, was and, and may still be your mother and father, your parents. Um, they, they and other caregivers, other adults who cared about you, you know, kind of helped you interpret your experiences, kind of showed you what your experiences mean. And as you get older, the, the people who help you interpret your, your world, your experiences, are your peers and, and, and then the larger society. So this idea that, that we, um, we depend on each other is profound. And Edmund Husserl said, his idea of intersubjectivity was that one must transcend oneself in order to understand another. So he recognized that understanding others was necessary to social interaction, but he thought that we had to do this deliberately, that we had to exert effort to get over ourselves and understand other people. And to some extent that's true, but the amount of effort that we have to expend in order to understand how other people feel about things is not that great, really, because we're already, we're already naturally doing that. That was recognized by Martin Heidegger, who said one need not transcend oneself to understand another because we are all already together, inextricably intertwined in the same web of shared experience. So Heidegger understood that we already learn to, to feel what others are feeling. We already learn, um, to, we're already, uh, in a way, predisposed 
to interpret the world the way other people interpret it because they show us how to interpret the world. Our interpretations are essentially theirs. Uh, we interpret the world together. Sartre, who came later, said that one cannot hope to untwine oneself from others, so one might as well give up trying. He recognized that we're so enmeshed in society that there's almost no way to separate ourselves from it. Indeed, there probably isn't. You probably can't separate yourself from society. Um, you, the way you are, has been largely determined by your experiences interacting with other people. Uh, they helped you become who you are. Uh, and what you think and what you feel really came from other people. And there's almost nothing you can do about it. Uh, in fact, you want it to be that way. If you were raised in isolation and had no interaction with other people, you wouldn't know how to, how to interpret your experiences. Your mind wouldn't have developed sufficiently. And Sartre kind of saw this dependence on other people as a bad thing. It's not seen as a bad thing anymore. Sartre also thought that our dependence on other people prevented us from being unique individuals. But I don't think that's true. I don't think that that's understood as the case anymore. And I think that what makes us unique as individuals is what we decide to internalize from society. Yes, the social world's gonna influence us in many ways over which we have no control, but we do have some amount of control. And what makes us individuals is what we, when we can choose, what we decide to choose from, from the, the social world to, to make our own. According to modern psychologists, Positive social interaction is necessary to the development and maintenance of a healthy human psyche. Right? So in order to develop, to develop normally and to maintain a normal mind, a normal psyche, um, requires positive social interaction. And we know that from many, um, we, know, we know that in many ways. For example, what about solitary confinement? What if you take an adult, a prisoner say, and stick them in, in a cell by themselves? Their psyche, their mind, their psyche can generate pretty fast. This, this comes from, these facts come from an article by Peter Smith in, the, in, a, in a journal called Crime and Justice. I wanna point out that as students of the University of Illinois, you have access to a huge range of literature, of primary and secondary scientific and other kinds of literature, academic literature, from journals. Whether you find them on PubMed or Google Scholar, you can look up the references that I give you and find the original articles, and you can download the, load them for free. And your readings each week are such an article. Every, every assigned reading each, for each week, for each module, is an article from the, from the literature that you can get for free as a University of Illinois student. And I strongly encourage you to, to uh, well, you have to read the assigned reading, but I encourage you to, to look up some of the other references to papers that might interest you that you come across in the course. And whenever I give you facts, I'll give you the reference for it. You might wanna look some of these up and read them in more detail. For example, if you're interested in the effects of solitary confinement and how it could constitute cruel and unusual punishment, even though we use it all the time in an American prison system, um, you can look up this article and read it by Peter Smith and read it for yourself. So I strongly encourage you to do that. And he reviewed a bunch of studies on the effects of solitary confinement on adult prisoners. And here's what they found. The adverse effects of solitary can begin within days, even hours, and can include anxiety, depression, and other mental health problems. And they can also include physical health problems, psychosomatic ailments, such as headache and stomachache. 
Now, studies have shown that most prisoners recover following release from solitary. Oops. Some, some show lasting psychological damage, especially social disabilities or social disablement. Okay. So some prisoners who were confined for a long time in solitary confinement don't recover fully after they're released. They, could, they have persistent deficits, cognitive deficits, and these cognitive deficits are most often, most often in the area of social interactions. Social interactions are very, very high level cognitive functions. They require social interaction in order to, to, to be developed and to be maintained, and they can be damaged through lack of social interaction. And that's for adults. How about children? What if children are isolated from others? This has very, very adverse consequences. Fortunately, there have been extremely few, maybe no, never, experiments in which human beings have been isolated just to see what happens. But it has happened inadvertently. And one famous example involves Romanian orphans, orphans in Romania. Uh, Romania is a relatively poor country. Um, some uh, adults had to give up their children. Sometimes they died or were sick and couldn't take care of their own children. The children went to orphanages. There were many of them. The number of children overwhelmed the staff who could take care of them. So the staff really couldn't interact with them. They just put them in cribs with bars, kind of like jail cells. And they fed them and gave them water, um, but otherwise minimally interacted with them. They didn't cuddle them, they didn't talk to them, they didn't play with them. And what happened to these poor orphans? Well, early institutionalization of orphans is associated with developmental abnormalities and lasting deficits on the physical, cognitive, and social levels. You might expect that it would have. Um, it would cause impairment on the cognitive level, but it also causes impairment on the physical level. So these children who were confined to a crib and not cuddled or talked to had smaller than normal body and head size. Their head size, their brain size was smaller and their body size was smaller. They, were, they, did, they did not develop robustly, either mentally or physically. They had problems in speaking and understanding language. Speaking and understanding language are fundamental social interactions. They had lower IQ, lower intelligence quotient. They had a higher risk for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, known as ADHD. And overall, they had abnormal brain development. And the brain areas most affected tended to be those that are most closely associated with communication and with social interaction. So, being socially isolated is bad for you. It's bad for your brain and it can even be bad for your body. It's bad for you if you're an adult, but it's especially bad for you if you're a child and you're still developing because social interaction is critical for the development of the brain. And we'll talk about that in detail later on in the course. Fortunately, some of these orphans were rescued before they were about one or two years old. If they were rescued before they were two years old, most of them developed normally. They could catch up. But those who were, who were rescued later on, when they were three or four or five years old, they never developed normally, even if they were, even if they were adopted by, by families and had normal, a normal level of social interaction after that. They had lasting deficits in communication and in social interaction. So, the point is that social interaction is critically, critically important uh, for all human beings, especially uh, young, young children whose brains are still developing. Okay, let's switch gears now and let's talk about the structure of the brain. When we talk about the brain and the nervous system, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about an organ that operates on multiple levels. And here's a nice diagram from Shepard, Gordon Shepard, in his 2004 textbook, the, the Synaptic Organization of the Brain. And he shows br the brain, uh, the nervous system, um, as manifested on multiple levels from genes, which encode proteins, 
proteins such as ion channels and transmitter receptors, to synapses, to microcircuits, which are small collections of synapses, to whole neurons, here's an example of a whole neuron, to small collections of neurons, circuits and local circuits, to large connections of collections of neurons, as in different brain regions, which interact, and then finally to overall behavior. And we'll be talking about all these different levels in this course, and even a couple more. So below the level of genes, I'm going to talk about the level of single molecules. And I'll even introduce you to the basic building blocks of life, which you've probably heard of before. There are basically four kinds of molecules that make up all living systems fat, sugar, amino acid, and nucleobase. We'll talk about that later in the course. So I'll talk about the basic building blocks of life, the basic building blocks that compose genes and proteins and everything else, of course. Um, and Shepard stopped at individual behavior, but in this course, we'll also talk about social behavior, okay? So we'll be covering all of these levels in this course. I just wanted to give you an overview, a sweeping overview right here. And right now, let's talk about the neuron. So here's a detailed diagram of a neuron. And I want to start off by saying, often, the, the slides that I show you are for your edification mainly, and you don't have to know all the details. And that's true for this, this slide. So one of the things I like about this slide is it illustrates the fact that a neuron is basically a cell. A neuron is a cell just like all the other cells in your body right? It has the, it's this roundish thing that has a bunch of organelles inside. And you probably learned about the cell already. You probably learned about the nucleus, where the DNA is. And you might even have learned about the endoplasmic reticulum, the rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. And you might have learned about mitochondria and microtubules and all the other organelles, right, that are necessary for cellular function. You might have learned about all of those. A neuron has those too, because a neuron is a cell, like other cells. Unlike other cells, a neuron is specialized for communication, communication between other neurons. So it has processes that extend off the cell. So in a neuron, the cell part itself is called the cell body or soma. And the, there are two, essentially two different kinds of processes. The most the most obvious one is the axon. The, most ob the biggest one is the axon. It extends off the cell body or soma, and it extends out, and it goes out, and it makes contact to other neurons. Okay, so we've got the soma and the axon, and the axon ends in the axon terminal, the axon terminal, and from the axon terminal sprouts off all these little synapses, which make contact onto other neurons. And where on the other neuron do the, does the axon terminal make contact? On the dendrites. And these are the dendrites of this particular brown neuron right here. Okay, so from the soma of a neuron extends the axon and numerous dendrites. And the dendrites take in, they receive synapses from other neurons, and the axon sends synapses out to other neurons. So you can think of the, the dendrites as the inputs and the axon and the axon terminal as the outputs from a neuron, okay? And here's a synapse in detail. You can see this is the, here. this would be coming from a neuron, this would be going to a neuron. We would, we would say that the, 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 um, the sending neuron is, is, is presynaptic, it comes before the synapse. The receiving neuron is postsynaptic, it comes after the synapse. And most synapses are chemical, they release transmitter. You've probably heard of neurotransmitters. Out of the out of the out of the axon terminal, the presynaptic terminal will come transmitter, and it will bind to receptors, which are proteins, transmitter receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. And depending upon the transmitter and the receptor, it will either activate or suppress the postsynaptic neuron. We'll talk about that all in detail later on in the course. The good news right now is that most of this detail you don't have to know. For your quiz uh, coming up on module one, you don't have to know about all these organelles. This is just to show you that a, a neuron really is like other cells, okay? You don't have to know that uh, for module one. You don't have to know the synapse in detail for module one. 
You don't have to know about myelin. What are these little blue things? Well, each of these little blue things is itself a cell. You see, here's a little blow up of it. And you can see that each of these little blue things has its own nucleus. Each of these little blue blobs here is a kind of specialized cell. It's a myelin cell. And it, what it does is it wraps itself around the axon. And if you have a whole bunch of these myelin cells wrapping themselves around an axon, they provide a kind of an insulation, a kind of an ionic electrical insulation to the neuron, to the axon, that helps it conduct neural impulses faster. Okay, and so the neural impulse is generated, uh, well, it, it, by the cell body. In fact, at this axon hillock region, the neural impulse goes down the axon, it gets to the axon terminal. And when the neural impulse invades the axon terminal, the axon terminal releases all its transmitter uh, onto the receptors of the postsynaptic cell. All of those details you don't really have to know from module one. And we'll talk about them um, later on as we go along in the course. But you don't really have to know the details of synaptic transmission or of neural function in detail for this course at all. If you want to learn about it, you can, of course. And there are many great textbooks on neuroscience, and you can learn about those things if you want to. For this course, we don't have to understand neural function or brain function in detail. I want to give you an overview of it. I want to give you the grand view of it, a big perspective on the brain on all levels, right? From the molecular to the behavioral level and on onto the social level. So we're not going to really delve on into any particular level too deeply because there are lots of other courses you can take on all these specific levels where you can go into great detail. The purpose of this course is really to give you an overall understanding of the brain as it operates in society. Okay, so for module one, what do you have to know about the neuron? Well, here it is. You have to know that neurons are similar to other cell types and have the same intracellular organelles but they have a distinct branching structure, okay? The main parts of a neuron are called the soma, which is the cell body, and the branching parts, the dendrite and the axon and the axon terminal. These are the four parts of the neuron that you have to know. Soma, dendrite, axon, and terminal, axon terminal. Here's the soma, the dendrites, the axon, and the axon terminal. That's what you need to know about neurons for this module. So let's go up a few levels to the level of overall brain organization. And this again, you don't have to know all of this. All of these details here you don't have to know. This is just to give you an, an overall idea. It's kind of a rough, rough drawing of the brain. But you know, here's the outline of a person's skull. Here's the front, here's the nose. This is the front of the skull, the back of the skull. And this orange thing here is what we commonly think of as the brain, right? This crumpled up thing is what we think of as the brain. And it is crumpled up, it's sort of folded up. Um, there are all these like hills and valleys. So here's a hill, here's a valley. Uh, neurobiologically, neuroanatomically, a hill is called a gyrus. G-Y-R-U-S, while a valley is called a sulcus, S-U-L-C-U-S, gyrus and sulcus. And if, as we go through the course, we'll be referring to specific parts of the brain as a specific gyrus or a specific sulcus. So those are terms that we are going, are going to come up. What we commonly think of as the brain is really the cortex. The cerebral cortex, okay? Why is it called cerebral? Well, it's part of the cerebrum. This big part of the brain up in here is the cerebrum. All of this here is cerebrum. The cortex is the covering. Cortex means cover in Greek. The cortex is the covering of the cerebrum, which means that down below in the cerebrum are other structures, like the thalamus and the hypothalamus and the striatum. We'll be talking about hypothalamus and striatum a lot in this course. They're down here. They're not folded up structures. They're, they have a different, a different organization that we'll talk about in a minute. But um, the orange part here is the cortex, the cerebral cortex, and that's what we commonly think of as the brain, this folded structure. It's also called the neocortex, the neo or new cortex. Why? Because in evolution, it's this neocortex, this big, crumpled up, folded up structure that developed the last. 
It's the most recent neural structure to have evolved, and human beings have the biggest one. So here we have the cerebrum and the cerebral cortex, this part specifically. We also have the brain stem and the spinal cord. The spinal cord goes down your spinal column to the rest of your body. It helps you move your, it, it, well, it's necessary for you to move your body and for your brain to get in signals from your body. This funny looking thing here is a cerebellum. It's mostly involved in movement control, but it also has some functions in cognition and even social cognition. And we're gonna basically talk about specific structures all over the brain in this course. And I'll, I'll name them as we get to them. Again, this is just to give you an overall view of what the brain looks like. You don't have to know these terms uh, for the quiz over module one. How are neurons in the brain organized? How are neurons in the brain organized? All these different brain regions are composed of lots and lots of neurons. Well, brain regions are organized either in layers or in clusters, either in layers or in clusters. So your cerebral cortex is a layered structure. And um, I think anatomists count like six layers, five or six layers, like one, two, three, four, five, six, something like that. It's five or six layers. Oh, here they are over here, Mark, five of these six layers. So these are neurons whose soma are organized in layers, and then their dendrites and axons contact each other. So there are layered structures, and the most prominent layered structure, of course, is your cerebral cortex. It's this big layered structure. If you, if you stretch it all out, it would be about as big as a pillowcase and pretty thin, maybe a few millimeters thin, um, you know, all of these, all of these six layers, sorry, all these six layers of neurons are probably um, only about a few millimeters thick, but then that gets crumpled up. And if you stretch it out, it'd be about as big as a pillowcase. If you crumple it up, then it fits inside your head. Clusters are called nuclei. If they occur inside the brain, inside your head, they're called nuclei. If they occur outside in your body, they're called ganglia. Okay, so there are clusters of neurons outside of your brain and spinal cord, near your organs. And those are important for your autonomic nervous system, like that part of your nervous system that controls, for example, your heart rate and the movement of your, of your, of your gut. We'll talk about that later in the course. Basically, right now, you have to remember that cell, neurons are organized either in layers or in clusters. And within the head, within the head and the spinal cord, the clusters are called nuclei. And a lot of nuclei are round, like the hypoglossal nucleus. You don't have to remember that term. It's just an example. The hypoglossal nucleus is fairly round, but nuclei can be oblong or have other funny, the clusters can have other weird shapes. This is called the superior olivary nucleus, the squiggly thing here. It's a nucleus. It's a cluster, but that has a very characteristic weird shape. Again, the details here aren't important. It's just important that you remember that neurons can be in the brain can be organized either in layers or in clusters. Um, the cortex is the most prominent layered structure and clusters are generally are called nuclei when they occur within the central nervous system, ganglia when they occur outside in the peripheral nervous system. And we'll be referring to nuclei having different names as we go along in the course. This is a slide showing the, 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 a comparison of the brains in different vertebrate animals. Vertebrate animals are animals with a backbone, okay? Invertebrates don't have a backbone. They have a shell or an exoskeleton like insects, shellfish, stuff like that. Vertebrates have a backbone. They have a vertebral column. And the simplest ones are fish. Then we go to amphibia, reptiles. Reptiles evolved into birds and mammals. And mammals can be of increasing brain size. Interestingly, all of the parts of the brain, brain stem, spinal cord, um, midbrain, cerebrum, all vertebrates have all those brain parts. They're just in different sizes. Even fish have a cerebrum, but it's this little tiny thing in fish. Fish have a little tiny cerebrum. And so do amphibia and reptiles. In birds, you see an enlargement of the cerebrum, but the cerebrum isn't big enough yet to really have a cortex. The cerebrum isn't big enough to have this cortex that's so big you have to crumple it up to fit it in the skull. By the time you get to mammals, the simplest mammals, rodents, well, maybe you have one fold. Maybe it's big enough to have one fold in the cortex, in the neocortex. 
And you can see that the, it's the, really the cortex that's changing as we go up in sophistication, in neural sophistication, neural development. By the time you get to cats, you've already got a big enough cortex that it has to be folded up. And then once you get to primates, well, now you have lots of folds. The monkey has, lots of, has a, a well-developed cerebral cortex with lots of folds. The chimp, even more so. Chimpanzee is the closest relative uh, to, the, to the human being. And by the time you get to us, well, now you have the biggest neocortex uh, in all of uh, known creation. And we can ask, why do we have such a big neocortex? What is it? Is it so that we can play chess uh, or figure out how to use you know, social media? Well, probably more of the latter. Um, there's an interesting hypothesis originated by a guy named Robin Dunbar. And here again, this article is available to you. This is a very famous article that was published in the journal Brain. You can look this up in uh, Google Scholar or PubMed or other search engines can probably bring it up. And you have access to this. You can read this article for free if you want to. And if you want to, I strongly encourage you to do it. That would be a great way to, to learn about the brain and to, and to increase your understanding of brain science. And what Dunbar did, well, Dunbar asked the question, uh, why is the neocortex so big in, in primates and in humans especially? And he computed this measure called the neocortex ratio. And the neocortex ratio is the ratio of the neocortex to the other structures of the brain. So if your neocortex is small and the other structures are relatively the same size, you'll have a neocortex ratio of about one or maybe even less than one. But if your neocortex is really huge relative to the other structures of your brain, then you'll have a very large, high uh, neocortex ratio. And so he found that different primates had different neocortex ratio. And this is Pan. So Pan is the chimpanzee. Humans aren't on this particular graph. But the, the, the animal with the, the, the primate, these are only primates now. They're simians, apes, and prosimians. Simians are monkeys. Apes are apes, um, chimpanzees, orangutans, bonobos. Prosimians are animals like um, lemurs and um, um, lorises. Lemurs and lorises are prosimians, very cute little animals, live in trees. Okay, They're down here. So they had the, the prosimians had the smallest neocortex ratio, and the apes, especially, um, well, apes and monkeys, but especially chimpanzees, had the highest neocortex ratio. And what he did was, these are plotted on a logarithmic scale, by the way, but you can still see this very clear positive correlation. He plotted neocortex ratio against mean group size, the size of the groups in which these, these specific primates lived. And what he found was that the animals with the, who lived in the biggest groups had the highest neocortex ratio. They had the biggest brains, in other words. So he concluded from that, that what you need all that brain for is to help you interact socially, right? Now, what about us? Well, Dunbar extended this to us. He got us on the graph finally too. This is us, homo sapiens. Again, this is a logarithmic scale here and here. And in this graph, instead of plotting neocortex ratio against group size, he plotted it against mean clique size, mean clique size. So he realized that even though the group you live in might be very large, um, you don't interact with all members of that group. You only interact with a certain number of, of uh, individuals within that group. And for human beings, our clique size is about 150. So if you sat down and think about it, you probably know, I mean, know, you know, interact with um, about 150 people in, in, in your life between family and friends and, and associates, business associates and, 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 and school associates. It's probably about 100, 100 to 150 people who you really know um, beyond, beyond just being casual friends, people who you really interact with. So when he plotted neocortex ratio against mean clique size, he found this very, very clear positive relationship, positive correlation. And so that led him to this social brain hypothesis where he postulated that we have all this extra brain to facilitate social interactions. 
And it really goes to show you that social interactions are very sophisticated neural processes. When you interact with somebody socially, it takes a lot of brain power. And that most of the most of the uh, of the of the of the power of our extended enlarged neocortex is devoted to social interaction and makes us better at working together and, and living together in society. That's a social brain hypothesis. So here's another look at the brain. Obviously, here's the front of the brain and the back. Here's the brain stem, goes down to the spinal cord. Here's the cerebellum, and here's the cerebral cortex. And what you'll notice here is that cerebral cortex is divided into four lobes, the frontal lobe, the occipital lobe, the temporal lobe, and the parietal lobe. Frontal is in the front, occipital is in the back, temporal is toward the bottom, parietal is toward the top. You can see that these lobes have gyri and sulci. Okay, a gyrus is a hill, a sulcus is a valley. Gyrus, G-Y-R-U-S, sulcus, S-U-L-C-U-S. Gyri and sul sulci will be mentioning specific ones as we go along in the course. And I think I'm gonna end here. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude part one here, and we'll pick up with these different brain regions uh, in the next lecture, in lecture two, which will cover part two of module one.